to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I'll pray as we uh, get into this passage. Our Heavenly Father, we have uh, just sung twice that you might, uh, through us, uh, through the power of the, your word, uh, work out your glory. We pray this morning that as we uh, hear Paul's uh, warning to the Corinthians, as we hear him uh, work at reorienting their way of looking at the world and their way of uh, looking at success and glory, we pray that you might also shape us and we pray that you might work through us your glory. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. How successful and impressive do you think or maybe hope uh, church uh, should or would be? To what degree do, uh, should we appeal to and, and hope to have some of the signs of success that the rest of our society recognizes? That's the if- issue in Corinth in these verses. Um, we're, we're jumping into the middle of a problem. You have to go back to the previous section to see that. So there, there's division and quarreling in this congregation. People are lining up behind their favorite Christian leader, their favorite preacher, and they're doing so on the basis of what they, uh, who they regarded as most impressive. Perhaps to give their own status a bit of a leg up, I follow so and so, and because he's really well regarded, then hopefully I'll be well regarded as well. Uh, perhaps to, to lift the status of the church as a whole in a society where really the religious competition was very stiff and the church was really quite small and where people, people really did love back in that society a, a really powerful speaker. And into this situation, Paul gives us a lesson in the nature of true success, in the nature of true wisdom in what matters most and why. His train of thought actually starts all the way back in chapter 1, verses uh, 13 and 14. He, he says that while they're busy dividing over who their favorite leader is, he, he really doesn't want any part of this Corinthian competitiveness. Verse 14, he's glad, he says, that actually he didn't baptize many of them, uh, not because he doesn't rate baptism. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, be baptized. Uh, uh, commanded uh, baptism, but, but because he doesn't want to give them another reason to be picking sides against each other. Verse 17, he says his job, first and foremost, is preaching the gospel. And preaching the gospel, but without words of human wisdom. That is, he refuses to try and impress people with his manner or his, his bearing. He refuses to try and win people by his style. He refuses to do anything that, people will, that means that people will be drawn into his message because really they're drawn to him. And in our passage from verse 18 onwards, he tells the Corinthians why that is. Why is that his approach? And as he does, he reminds them of three realities that will put a pin in their posturing and heal these, these quarrels. He reminds us of three realities that press us towards humble unity as God's people, that press us towards a holy suspicion of anything in church life that smacks of shiny, people-centered showmanship. And the first reality he points us to is the fact that God is judging human wisdom. One of the key words that pops up in this passage again and again, if you noticed during the reading, is wisdom. And there are two kinds as far as Paul is concerned. You've got, on the one hand, you've got the world's wisdom or human wisdom. And on the other hand, you've got God's wisdom. And the idea of human wisdom, human wisdom, the world's wisdom here is... Uh, human reason and understanding and ability and cleverness, 
all used to pursue success and influence and honor and status and power. Which means, on the whole, there is something very human-centered about it. And Paul says he's got absolutely no interest in mixing the the message of Jesus with so-called words of wisdom. Because, verse 18, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to who? To those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The the message of Jesus, he says, doesn't need a, a dose of cleverness to sort of beef it up and make it more attractive. In fact, actually, thinking that it does will put us in danger. Because if we think that the message of the cross is foolish and think that it's weak, we are at risk of perishing. That is, we are at risk of divine judgment. And why is that? Well, verse 19, he quotes Isaiah chapter 29. It goes all the way back several hundred years to God addressing rebellious, sinful, self-sufficient Israel. And he told them back then that he would destroy the wisdom of the wise and frustrate the intelligence of the intelligence. They were so impressive, they were so self-sufficient, they could get on just nicely and he says, no, you can't. And in fact, actually, that, that destroying of the wisdom of the wise, Paul says, is happening now. Because in verse 21, he says, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. He basically says that God has made the search for him by human inquiry and human thought and human observation a, a dead end. God has on purpose made it a bit like going into one of those hedge mazes but where every single route leads to a dead end and you you can't get through. You can never get to the finish just by human means. And instead, second half of verse 21, he makes the route to him, the route of salvation, go through what seems terribly, terribly foolish when looked at from the point of view of human cleverness, Christ crucified. It's a phrase that we're very familiar with, that we have uh, at least 1,500 years or so of Christian history in the UK, so we perhaps get a little used to Jesus dying on the cross. But when you think about it, it's a strange message. Christ crucified, uh, God's king humiliated and executed like a criminal, and that's how you win. One writer says it's a little bit like proclaiming as good news uh, that the victor has been vanquished, or the market has collapsed, or the holiday has been cancelled. Picture it. Uh, Imagine sitting in an airport waiting to go for your nice two weeks away somewhere warm and uh, with plenty of good food. And suddenly the the Thompson rep arrives and he's dressed in full official uniform and he uh, arranges actually for some upbeat music to be playing as he arrives and actually a couple of other reps to be sort of dancing either side of him. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, I have wonderful news. I'm delighted to inform you that your flight has been cancelled that your holiday booking is void and that there will be no refunds. And with that, he lets off a couple of party poppers. That, that's the sort of, sort of level that the message of Christ crucified operates on. Surely not good news. Surely not a, a message of salvation and victory. But that is precisely it. In revealing himself ultimately in Christ crucified, in in bringing salvation through Christ crucified, God is undermining and judging human wisdom, human cleverness, human pretension and pride. When it comes to ultimate things, when it comes to knowing God, when it comes to being on good terms with God and enjoying his salvation, the wisdom of the wise will not help you. 
the intelligence of the intelligent will be a waste of time because what you need is the foolishness of God, the weakness of God that overcomes and outsmarts them both, that consigns them to the, the rubbish dump of eternity, Christ crucified. It's a, a grand reversal, if you like, a, a grand turning things on their heads, which means then that quarreling and fighting and dividing in church based on who's the most impressive speaker, who's the most impressive leader, is a terrible, terrible mistake. Admiring teachers in church because of their, their force of personality or because of their speaking style or because they just have that great turn of phrase or because they just know what to say to, to pull on your heartstrings. It's an exercise in futility. Because those things are tied up to a, a people-centered wisdom that is headed for disaster. Now the Bible doesn't mean, Paul doesn't mean that teaching the Bible should be boring and monotone. But we do need to get used to the idea that Christ crucified is enough. That it doesn't need any additions to make it more effective or more palatable. It doesn't need preachers get capable of great performances. It, it doesn't need a, a shift of, spo of focus or a, a little touch of spin. God has purposely chosen to work through a message that people find strange and silly and insulting. He wants to disabuse us of our pride and our self-sufficiency. And so anything where the focus is on what's humanly impressive, powerful speakers, big numbers of people, slick presentations, rather than on Christ crucified, is a step in the wrong direction. In fact, a, a, step, a step towards disaster. Paul takes things uh, on to a, a more personal level then. He ramps it up again and gets very personal in verses 26 to 31 because he reminds the Corinthians and, in fact, us when we reflect a little that we are not so clever. Into an atmosphere filled with pride and self-promotion and a quest for honor and status, Paul reminds the Corinthians that actually God's grand reversal can be seen in living, walking technicolor in them. They were busy quarreling because they were pushing for status in the church community. Everybody wanted to be someone, push the credentials of their favorite leader, and then enjoy some of the status that goes with being attached to them. But you can imagine how these things went. Of course, I knew Paul right from the start. Yes, I, I was there when Apollos said X, Y, or Z. Uh, yes, I, well, actually, I worked with Peter a little bit on that sermon. But Paul says, don't forget where you came from. Verse 26, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Maybe a few people in the congregation had a, a bit of status in society before they became Christians. But not many of them. Paul says, actually, you guys are a walking picture of God's grand reversal God undermines human pretension and pride by bringing salvation through the lowly message of Christ crucified. And God undermines human pride and pretension by saving people like you. He hasn't populated the church with the cream of society as if it needed a bit of a boost from the social status that they bring with them. Verse 27, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Not exactly complimentary. But it is said with warmth and humility. Notice that Paul starts this section in verse 26 by addressing the congregation as brothers. In the middle of verse 30, he switches from talking about you are like this and you are like this, and he says us. 
he's not playing the pride game here. He stands with them. He's on the same level with them. But there is a point to be made. You see, while these Christians are climbing over each other for the sake of status, Paul reminds them that that was the opposite of God's intention when he called them. He chose them on purpose, verse 29, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him, not because of you, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. The idea is that we don't bring status and social cachet to the gospel to Christ, but that God chooses the weak and the humble and he gives us new status. He, he attaches us to Jesus. Jesus who is wisdom from God. True wisdom. And the upshot then is that there's, there's just no room for boasting about anything to do with ourselves. No, no room for status hunting. Because God and only God has given us any form of status that matters. And so the only boasting that's really worth anything the only boasting that's appropriate is boasting about God and what he has done. Which will really put an end to the sorts of divisions that are going on in Corinth. It's what will help us stay united instead of falling into little cliques. It's pretty hard to start forming into little groups of, of, uh, of like-minded people who we think are you know, on our level our sort of people when we remember that actually God has very little interest in the things that might make us something to the rest of the world. In fact, when we remember that actually God is hostile towards anything that might cause us to be pleased with ourselves. You know, may, you know how it goes. Maybe family connections, maybe success in work, maybe uh, having achieved a certain standard of living and owning a house with the right postcode, uh, maybe being well-liked, maybe some sort of educational achievement. There are all sorts of things that, that make us feel pretty pleased with ourselves. But before God, they don't count for anything. The only status that matters is being in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness and holiness and redemption and that puts us all on, on one level all of us in Christ we are all each other's sort of people we dare not divide along lines of status or respectability or, or anything else. We dare not play the, uh, the, uh, any sort of ranking game in church. Some people on this rung, some people on that rung. We're to sit together and socialize together and worship together and serve together, all together. Because there really is no room for this thinking that some people are on a rung down here and some people are on a rung here and some people are up here. None of us has anything to boast about except for what God has done for us and in us. Well, having reminded them of how God's grand reversal has worked actually in them, Paul reminds them of how actually it drove his ministry when he arrived in Corinth, how it affects sharing the gospel, and he reminds them to keep the focus on Jesus. Now, back, at a t back at that time, uh, uh, public speaking was perhaps more of a, a big deal than it is now. Uh, and when public speakers arrived in a city, the aim was really to, to make a, a, a real reputation for themselves. You need a good performance and you, you do the rounds perhaps of some uh, high-class dinners. And you, you were aiming to give a performance that would draw applause. It was about showmanship, often with little regard for the truth. The aim was to win people over by style and charisma and a bit, of, a bit of manipulation, if you like. If they'd had flashing lights and dry ice and been able to come on stage with Eye of the Tiger in the background, they'd have done it. But not Paul. Chapter 2, verse 1. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. 
He didn't have any tricks up his sleeve when he arrived in Corinth. No publicity campaign, no posters with his his name in big letters across the top and him in black and white with a really moody look on his face. No, No applause leaders strategically placed amongst his audience. And that's because actually he didn't want to be the focus of attention at all. What he wanted people to know about What he wanted people to go home talking about, what he wanted them to to remember the next day was Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ. And not palatable, attractive Jesus. Not socially acceptable Jesus. Maybe for us, the, the Jesus who accepts everybody who gives us uh, great ideas for a life well lived and a a better functioning society, who gives us some great quotes to attach to whatever else we think is important in life. 2 verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Jesus who died for sin The Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for many. The Jesus who endured the cup of God's wrath against sin. The Jesus who said that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. For the Corinthians, maybe for us, the embarrassing Jesus was the focus of his sermons. And he avoided anything that would water that down or blunt its sharpness or shift people's attention somewhere else. Not that Paul had a problem with good speaking. He didn't have a problem with being interesting. Sometimes it's possible to read these verses and imagine that he sort of stood there with kind of hands by his side and looking down at his shoes and speaks in a, a barely audible monotone. But that's not it. His letters are well written. He, he, he's all for effectively engaging people with effective communication. But he has no intention of manipulating people. No intention of playing to the crowd. No intention of letting style overwhelm truth and begin himself as a speaker to sort of eclipse Jesus. Maybe you know that experience where you've heard somebody speak in church and you found it very interesting uh, maybe, maybe even moving. And the speaker we, really won you over. And yet actually you go home and you, you think more carefully about it and you realize that actually it was just that, well, they had a really interesting voice and they could tell a story really well. And actually when you think about it, there wasn't actually that much to what they said. They just seemed to link funny story after funny story after funny story and they could, they could tell a joke. Paul had no interest in preaching like that. In fact, he was willing to turn up when he was far from his best. Verse 3, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Neither the speaker, nor the sermon, nor the subject had anything impressive about them. But there was power not power that we are used to in, uh, in, in human terms. But despite the, all, all that was unimpressive, all that was unattractive, the Holy Spirit was at work and people became Christians. Against all human odds, people heard the gospel and became followers of Jesus. That is the power that was at work. And the upshot of this... The aim was that the Corinthians wouldn't trust trust in a Paul who impressed them and won them over with himself. But they, they would trust in God and his power for salvation. And when you get that, when that starts to make sense, there's really no room for dividing over what's humanly impressive. With the cross of Jesus, God has worked a grand reversal And his intention is to draw people to trust in him and to to boast in him and to deflate this illusion of human-centered power and success. Which means these verses really raise some crucial issues when it comes to to what wins us over in church and to, to how we share the gospel ourselves. 
We need to beware of being drawn to a, a person rather than to Jesus. We need to beware of being so concerned about a tight, slick presentation that, that actually it begins to override all sorts of things. We need to be so very careful about manipulating people. I used to help out on a, a Christian summer camp over a number of years, and they, they'd run from Saturday to Saturday. And I remember more than once that the guy who uh, was the main leader of those camps getting us together on, on the, probably the Thursday in the week and just reminding us that at this stage in the week, the young people would be really pretty tired. And so we should be very careful not to take advantage of them when it came to sharing the gospel. Very careful not to manipulate them. Very careful to not take advantage of the fact that they might be a bit more emotional than normal. To make sure that they got enough sleep. To, if they wanted to talk, make sure that we did it at a sensible time of day. We're to put the focus on Christ crucified to avoid manipulation, to be straightforward and self-effacing so that everyone's faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness and holiness and redemption. Therefore it is written, let him who boasts Boast in the Lord. Let's pray.